Greetings and salutations, loyal viewers of this channel. Today we are going to discuss what the media is calling the exoneration of Adnan Saeed. Adnan Saeed, I don't know if you guys heard, they tested some DNA and they discovered that Adnan Saeed's DNA was not on these items that they tested for. Therefore, according to the media, he's innocent. Who could have predicted that this would have been the outcome of this case? at this point in time who could have mentioned exactly what they were going to do and how most people were going to fall for it oh wait a minute that was me let me roll the clip you see dna evidence does not come with a timestamp. it doesn't come with a date of deposit the reason why the defense team is harping on the dna testing that supposedly wasn't done is because they know for a fact that a bunch of people have been in and out of Heyman lee's car so they want to catch the dna because all they're trying to do is shed ambiguity on the conviction not actually discover who the killer was on top of that it's a no risk proposition for them because they know for a fact that adnan was her ex-boyfriend he had been in that car at other periods of time so even if we discover that he did in fact leave dna all over that vehicle it's not really going to make a difference because we all acknowledge that he was in the vehicle so they have a built-in excuse for if the dna comes back Adnan to say oh well that actually doesn't prove any guilt this is one of the reasons why even though we all think DNA is the gold standard of evidence we have to understand that it can be just as circumstantial as any other piece of evidence especially depending on the scenario if you do DNA testing on the vehicle what you're going to find is that a bunch of people were in that vehicle at any given time you'll find that her parents were likely in the vehicle her younger brother her cousin other people that she would have given rides to her her current boyfriend or her boyfriend at the time of her murder and Adnan so what you end up doing is creating a situation where you're proving something that doesn't really impact the case but it sheds ambiguity and it allows you to make more crappy commentary more crappy documentaries and assert that this evidence is somehow stronger than any of the evidence put forward when in reality it's the exact opposite now hold on to your hats everybody because I will explain to you in great detail in simple terms in a concise manner Manner, in a beautiful manner if I might say how this DNA testing was deliberately done in such a way in order for them to give a phony exoneration to Adnan and why it doesn't stand up to any level of the evidence presented at trial which is still overwhelming and points to Adnan being the killer of Heyman Lee however this video is sponsored so since I have to pay the bills I'll toss it over to the sponsor then I'll bring it back over here and we'll discuss it on the other side visible signs of aging only get worse over the years because of a thing that we lose called collagen every decade you lose about 10% of the collagen production within your body and that means by the time that you're 45 you're producing about 30% less collagen and this is important because collagen rejuvenates collagen keeps your skin looking young it keeps your hair looking nice and this is one of the reasons why I recommend going to the basic fountain of youth that is health with justice and getting yourself a collagen supplement this powder actually has a five Five different types of collagen within it and it could help fight the visible signs of aging so you can look good because when you look good you feel good and you can try this over at healthwithjustice.com for 51% off and risk-free with a 60-day money-back guarantee that's healthwithjustice.com healthwithjustice.com so for some reason people seem to think that DNA is this requirement that we must have in all the cases in order to prove guilt First and foremost, 92% of convictions have nothing to do with DNA. DNA is never introduced at trial as a form of evidence. It is neither an exonerating nor is it a convicting factor in 92% of cases. Secondly, this murder when Adnan Saeed murdered Heyman Lee took place in 1999. So the things that we looked for in terms of DNA in 1999 are far different from what we look for now. So when you have things like a murder weapon, or you have somebody completely denying any affiliation, the fact that you could use more modern DNA testing in order to look back and see if possibly you can tie that person to the scene of the crime, thus proving their guilt, 
that is a good use of DNA evidence. However, in this case, this is not what happened. In this case, Adnan Saeed murdered Heyman Lee because she broke up with him, meaning that they were ex-boyfriend and ex-girlfriend. So there was never any question on whether or not Adnan had been at any point in time in Heyman Lee's vehicle. This is why I called the DNA testing a farce, because what they were going to do is that if the DNA testing showed anything related to Adnan, they were going to say, well, of course his DNA is going to be there. DNA doesn't come with a timestamp, and Adnan was the ex-boyfriend, so obviously he had been in that car before. So you ended up setting up a system where you couldn't disprove any hypothesis. On top of that, the items tested and what actually yielded DNA should be quite telling for those of you who perpetuate the innocence fraud, because what they tested were the clothes that Heyman Lee was wearing the day of the murder. And it turns out, through the modern testing where they looked for DNA that was undiscoverable back in 1999, which by the way, they ended up doing in 2018 upon appeal, they were not able to find any DNA samples for anyone, so those clothes were completely useless in terms of evidence. However, they did test one more item, and these were the shoes of Heyman Lee. Now, these shoes of Heyman Lee were not shoes that were found on her body. These were shoes of Heyman Lee that were found in her vehicle. So, according to the DNA testing, they found four DNA profiles on Heyman Lee's shoes. Therefore, since none of those profiles were Adnan Saeed's, Adnan Saeed is supposedly innocent. But here's the thing. Heyman Lee's shoes were probably not touched by the person who strangled her during the course of the strangling. Here's the thing, if you actually look at the shoes or anybody's shoes and you decided to test it for DNA because we walk around on them and people leave biological material everywhere, you would likely find multiple DNA samples. Here's the thing, none of the DNA samples found on the shoes match these supposed alternative suspects that supposedly would have been the people to kill Heyman Lee instead of Adnan Saeed. So these shoes don't prove anything. And the idea that we have now four killers because four people's DNA were found on shoes in Heyman Lee's vehicle is absurd. And remember, there is nothing to indicate that any of these four DNA profiles that were found on Heyman Lee's shoes have any timestamp or any association with her murder. If these were the shoes that she used while she was doing athletics, she could have got people sweat from the gym that she was running on on those shoes. If these were shoes that she wore anywhere, if somebody spit on the sidewalk, guess what? That saliva would be DNA that could be discoverable if preserved properly 20 years later when they did this DNA testing. So the idea that we have four new killers, that there's four real killers in this case, and that overwhelms all of the evidence that proves Anad Saeed is guilty beyond any doubt, is absurd. And if you really believe that, then I would suggest that you call for more DNA testing of more of Heyman Lee's shoes. Do we have the shoes that Heyman Lee actually kept in her home at the time that she was murdered? Because I'm sure if you tested those shoes for DNA, you could find even more real killers. Why not test shoes that she wore at a bowling alley? Imagine all of the real killers you could find if Heyman Lee happened to go bowling at some point in her life, and you could prove that those shoes were somewhat connected to her at at one point in her life. You don't have to connect it to the murder. All you have to do is prove that she touched something at one point, find a DNA sample that shows that some other person's biological material became in contact with the thing that she touched, and apparently that proves Adnan Saeed is innocent. I mean, honestly, was it even an argument at any point during the course of the trial that Adnan Saeed took Heyman Lee's shoes from the back of her car and decided to strangle her with her own shoes covering his hands? Who put this theory forward? Why was this relevant? Relevant. Why was this tested? I'll tell you why this was tested. It's exactly what I called out earlier. It was in order to find any kind of DNA profile so that way you could say that there was some real killer present. And I talked about, of course, how if Adnan Saeed's DNA was found on anything related to the car, they would have excused it by saying that DNA doesn't have a timestamp, DNA is not dated, etc, etc. But they don't grant that same courtesy to whoever happened to have their DNA profile connected to Heyman Lee's shoes that were found in 
in her vehicle, not found on her body, so what do they even have to do with her murder? Let's be clear about the evidence against Adnan Saeed so you can understand why it's overwhelming. Adnan Saeed said on January 13th, he went to school. During his time at school, he decided to leave with one Jay Wilds. Jay Wilds was the star witness against Adnan Saeed, and he gave details related to Heyman Lee's death that only somebody who was an accomplice after the fact would have known. By the way, notice how all the people who are claiming Adnan Saeed is innocent aren't talking about getting Jay Wilde's conviction overturned, even though he was convicted as an accomplice to Adnan Saeed. Weird how Jay actually owns up to his role in this crime, but Adnan is in full denial, and everybody who's on his team goes into full denial with him, despite the overwhelming inconsistencies. Now, according to Adnan, in his own words, he decided to leave school with Jay because it was Jay's girlfriend's birthday, and Adnan wanted to make sure that Jay got his girlfriend a birthday present. The problem is, when you ask Adnan to go back and tell his version of what happened that day, to refute Jay's story, everything becomes a lot mushier. Yes, he hung out with Jay on the 13th, both during and after school, but he doesn't remember exactly where they went or what they did or what time it was. Here's what he's got. January 13th unfolded like any other day, a normal, mostly uneventful day. He says there are a couple of things that do stand out, though. That day was Stephanie's birthday. Stephanie was one of Adnan's best friends, and also Jay's girlfriend. Adnan had gotten Stephanie a birthday present, a stuffed reindeer, which he'd given to her in second period, Miss Efron's English class. And um, uh, one, uh, uh, it occurred to me that day that I was going to ask her boyfriend, Jay, did he get her a gift? So sometime during the day, uh, before noon... Um, Wait, Adnan, just hold up for a second. Why, sure. why did you care whether Jay got Stephanie a, a present? Like, what's it to you? Well, uh, Stephanie was a very close friend of mine, as I mentioned, and it was just, uh, I just kind of wanted to make sure that she also got a gift from him. You know, she had mentioned to me that um, she was looking forward to getting a gift from him. She mentioned she was really happy to get the gift that I gave her. So it just, as I would with any friend, I just kind of, uh, we don't went to check on that. I kind of had a feeling that maybe he didn't get her a gift. And I had free periods during school, so it wasn't like, you know, it, it, it was not abnormal for me to leave school to go do something and then come back. So I went to his house, and I, and I asked him, you know, did you happen to get a present for Stephanie? He said no. So I said, if you want to, you can, you can drive me back off to school. You can borrow my car, and uh, you can go to the mall and get her a gift or whatever, and just come uh, pick me up after track practice that day. So that's... Adnan Saeed, in his own words, making the claim that he hung out with Jay because he decided that he wanted to check on him because he had a feeling that Jay didn't get Jay's girlfriend a present for her birthday. And that's why he didn't call him on his new cell phone. He didn't page Jay, who had a pager because he was a drug dealer. He decided, unprompted and uninvited, to drive over to Jay's house to ask him if he got his girlfriend a present because his girlfriend said, I'm looking forward to getting a present from Jay, my boyfriend, and I would be very disappointed if I did not. If you believe this, you're an idiot. If you believe this, you're insane. But I want you to remember that key part at the end of it where he says that Jay specifically was told to pick him up after track practice. That's right. Adnan says he told Jay after he gave him his car and his cell phone because he was so compelled to make sure Jay got his girlfriend a present that Jay should pick him up at track practice at the school. Remember that. So I said, if you want to, you can, you can drive me back off to school. You can borrow my car, and uh, you can go to the mall and get her a gift or whatever, and just come uh, pick me up after track practice that day. Now, Jay says the reason he had him borrow the car and the cell phone from Adnan was because he was going to call him later after he murdered Hey Min Lee in order to get picked up. Which one do you think makes more sense? On top of that, during the course of the day, other people saw Jay and Adnan together. Two independent witnesses testified that they saw both of them together. On top of that, witnesses testified that Jay told them that Adnan had killed Hey Min Lee. On the day that she went missing, he had told her that they killed her and buried her. Now, Hey went missing on January 13th, and her body was not found until six weeks later. Yet, you have three people who know the day of the murder that Adnan Saeed committed the murder, and they all came forward to testify to that fact in court. So, how these people all knew coincidentally that Hey Min Lee was strangled to death 
doesn't make any sense if you're one of these Adnan Saeed truthers. On top of that, if you're going to go with the explanation that Jay Wilds for some reason killed Heyman Lee and then framed himself as the accomplice and Adnan as the perpetrator, you're going to have to come up with some form of motive because Adnan Saeed actually has a motive in the case. He was distraught due to their breakup. She started dating somebody 13 days before. Adnan had written on the back of a note where Heyman Lee was telling him to back off, stop harassing her, that he's going to kill her. Okay, here it goes. I'm really getting annoyed that the situation is going the way it is. At first, I kind of want to make this easy, for me and for you. People break up all the time. Your life is not going to end. You'll move on and I'll move on. But apparently you don't respect me enough to accept my decision. This was definitely written probably the Monday or Tuesday after homecoming. The more fuss you make, the more I'm determined to do what I gotta do. I'll be busy today, tomorrow, and probably till Thursday. I got other things to do. Better than give you any hope that we'll get back together. I really don't see that happening, especially now. I never want to end this like this, so hostile and cold. Hate me if you will, but you should remember that I can never hate you. Now you might say this letter on its own only goes to her state of mind at that period of time, and this is where you would be wrong, because Adnan and Hay would actually write notes back and forth, and this letter was in the possession of Adnan, and what he wrote on the back of this note was the following, right at the top, and by the way, the handwriting analysis proves that this was in fact him. He wrote, I'm going to kill. And this was all presented during the course of the trial. The classic thing, girl leaves guy, guy gets angry. If you can't be with me, you're not going to be with anyone. He kills her. That's this case textbook. Jay Wilde's killing Heyman Lee doesn't make any sense. No motive, no rational person would come to that conclusion. And on top of that, since Adnan says that he decided to go with Jay and he decided to force the issue for them to go and hang out at the mall to get a present for Jay's girlfriend, if you believe that nonsense it means that jay must be the luckiest person in the history of the world because he was able to get adnan's car and cell phone from him unprompted at the same time for no reason that he was going to kill Heyman lee on top of that adnan told the police that he was asking Heyman lee for a ride the day she went missing it was just a normal day to me i think i told her that day that i was going to go get my cell phone so i, I called her the night before and i think she wrote the number down in her diary I've never talked to a police officer before. And when he called me, I was like, I was literally high on marijuana and then a cop calling me. So when he asked me about Hayes, I just remember kind of like, hey, did I ask Hayes for a ride that day? I spoke to uh, Mr. Syed, and he advised me that uh, he was supposed to get a ride home from the victim, but he got detained at school and thought that she just got tired of waiting and left. So Adnan... The day that Heyman Lee went missing was contacted by the police because people were worried when she didn't show up to pick up her cousin, and Adnan told the police that day that he asked Hay to pick him up because he didn't have a car. Remember, he just told in the podcast, the host of the podcast, that Jay was supposed to pick him up from track practice, but now all of a sudden, when it's talking to the police, and by the way, this is corroborated by what was testified to in trial, Adnan was actually supposed to get a ride from Hay, thus making him the last person to see her alive. Are you a bit confused by this story right now? Are you having a little bit of difficulty on why Adnan can't keep his story straight? How about this little anecdote? Adnan Saeed would actually call Heyman Lee, according to phone records, each and every day. In fact, he called her three times the night before in order to arrange this pickup meeting, which is weird because he says that this was a spontaneous thing because he lent Jay the car because he was really concerned that Jay didn't get Stephanie a birthday present. But the thing is, is that after Hay went missing and Adnan had no reason to suspect that she was dead, Adnan never called her again. After she died, the day that she died, Adnan never called at all. He called her every single day. When somebody goes missing, isn't the first dumb normal guy thing that you would try to do 
to be to call her? Well, Adnan didn't. I wonder why he didn't think calling her would do anything. Now, Jay told the police that he asked for the ride because that was his plan to kill him, and he was going to call him on his own cell phone and have Jay pick him up. So, which one makes more sense? That Adnan coincidentally gave the real killer the vehicle and the cell phone, all the things that would lead to his conviction, and then coincidentally got a ride from the murder victim, and then coincidentally, Jay Wilde somehow was able to kill her because remember, he knew and told people that Heyman Lee was strangled and buried in a park that day. How does that make any sense? Again, people talk nonstop about the inconsistencies in Jay Wilde's story, and they'll say, oh, Jay Wilde's was inaccurate about this or that moment, but all the inaccuracies in Jay Wilde's story don't actually matter. Him saying that he didn't see the body in front of his grandmother's house because he was a drug dealer dealing drugs out of his grandmother's house and he was worried about consequences for her totally makes sense. But the consistencies, the things that he told other people at the time, a day of, before the body was discovered, and the things that he told the police that are corroborated by the evidence are the actual key components of this story. This is what ties it together. Adnan has multiple fake alibis that don't make any sense. Adnan has a reason for hanging out with Jay that doesn't make any sense. It rings false. Adnan actually asked Heyman Lee for a ride that day that she went missing and that's the day that she was murdered. None of that makes any sense. Need I remind you that at one point in time during the course of the trial, the defense was going to produce 80 witnesses to claim that the evening at around the time that they were burying the body together, Adnan was at the mosque. Here, Mr. Urich, that is the prosecutor, by the way. These witnesses will be used to support the defendant's alibi as follows. On January 13th, 1999, Adnan Masood Saeed attended Woodlawn High School for the duration of the school day. By the way, this is in fact false. At the conclusion of the school day, the defendant remained at the high school until the beginning of his track practice. After track practice, Adnan Saeed went home and remained there until attending services at his mosque that evening. These witnesses will testify as to the defendant's regular attendance at school, track practice, and the mosque, and that his absence on January 13th, 1999 would have been noticed. And by the way, there's a bunch of names if you look through this two full pages almost of names and it's signed by the defense attorney. This was presented up until the defense figured out that the prosecution could prove Adnan wasn't there. So those 80 people that were going to lie for Adnan Saeed and that one alibi that he was going to go with all of a sudden went away and were supposed to pretend that they don't exist, even though I have the document where they claim that they were going to testify and prove that he was there. Then you have the Asia McLean situation where she says she saw Adnan at the library. Adnan didn't even say he was at the library that day, but sure, whatever. And then when she was actually called upon to testify in a 2012 appeal, guess what? She refused to testify after being convinced that Adnan was the killer by the district attorney. I figured with him being a prosecutor that he would be a reliable source for information. And I gave him a call and I actually took notes on the conversation. I told him that I saw Saeed in the library in 1999. He told me that they had cell phone records and they had a witness that confessed to helping him bury Hey, and then I wrote down something Yurik said to me directly. If I had any doubt that Anand didn't kill Hay, it would be my moral obligation to see that he didn't serve any time. Based on what he told me, I felt that the conviction was, you know, airtight. And so I didn't see the need for me to get involved 10 years later. Now, if you had a conversation with somebody who's accused of murder at the same time that you had the conversation with them, how are you going to be convinced that this person was the killer? The reason why Asia McLean didn't testify in 2012 is because she was afraid of perjury charges. Two people at the time heard her say and were told directly by her and they signed sworn affidavits to the fact that she would lie for Adnan Saeed because she believed in Adnan Saeed. When she actually went to trial, push came to shove, turns out she backed 
out. So I don't know if you guys are counting, but that is three alibis down the tube for Adnan Saeed. But again, we're only going to talk about the inconsistencies in Jay Wild's story, as in him changing where he saw Heyman's body in the trunk of the vehicle. That's the only thing that we're going to discuss. The next thing that we go over is the cell phone data. Now, everybody and their mother says incoming calls totally not reliable for location data outgoing calls totally reliable because the incoming calls actually ping at the time of burial to Adnan's cell phone in the Lincoln Park area. Guess what? That's where Heyman Lee's body was found. Guess what? That cell tower in particular covers basically the park and not much else. So supposedly, two independent incoming calls randomly and accidentally, for no reason at all whatsoever, ping the burial site at around 7 o'clock where Adnan can account for his whereabouts. And then after that, and people don't want to talk about this, at the car dump site at 804, an outgoing call pings that location. So you have an outgoing call, which supposedly, according to the conspiracy nuts, is reliable for location data. After the burial at the car dump site, that's totally just dismissed and ignored for no reason. And two coincidental incoming calls that are for some reason unreliable, even though the serial podcast themselves, when they reached out to experts, found no evidence of any distinction between the reliability and location data from incoming and outgoing. And those claims come from one piece of paper from AT&T with no known author. And they've actually brought in wireless experts to testify in appeal that were more qualified than the one who testified at trial to state that that's ridiculous no 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 for some reason that's totally debunks everything for some reason on top of that there's another stupid point that keeps being brought up in my comments and that is the so-called lividity issue that is the so-called full frontal lividity now where this comes from is where all of these conspiracy theories come from which is adnan saeed's best friend's sister rabia the person who has sold a best-selling book off of this, who did her own podcast, who has become a millionaire off of this, who the HBO documentary is based on her book. This person released an excerpt from the autopsy that said something about full frontal lividity. And although to be clear, the phrase full frontal lividity is actually a bit of a misnomer. That's a bit of a paraphrase that came from Rabia for some reason, because what it actually says was lividity was present and fixed on the anterior surface of the body, except in areas exposed to pressure. Now, anterior does not mean frontal. It doesn't mean full frontal. If you look up the definition of anterior, guess what? It means closer to the front. For those of you who don't know, when you die and whatever position you're in, gravity pulls your blood to that position. So the idea is, since Heyman Lee was buried kind of on her side, then therefore full frontal lividity would mean that she was laid face down, lividity set in, and then she was buried, thus disrupting the timeline. That is the point that is brought forward by this excerpt of an autopsy put forward by Rabia, the propagandist who's making money off of pretending Adnan is innocent. Now, the reason I say excerpt from the autopsy is because it is just in fact that because after the state realized what they were doing that they were using this excerpt they actually released the full autopsy and it turns out one page later they described exactly where the blood was pooling and the blood was pooling inside of her face and part of her chest the exact parts that would have been exposed to the ground where Heyman Lee was buried in the position that she was found to be buried in. So the lividity is not full frontal lividity that is made up by Rabia, that is something taken out of context from the autopsy, and if you bother to read the autopsy, one page later, it's completely debunked. Generalized skin slippage was noted and liver mortis was prominently seen on the anterior upper chest and face, a poorly defined paranasal areas of dark discoloration of the skin was seen extending to the right of the face, which approximately measured one and a half to two inches. There was a fairly circumcised dark brown skin discoloration measuring one inch in diameter on the left cheek. These two last described areas are consistent with pressure applied with contact with the elements. So what this is saying is that the blood settled nearer to the front than to the back however there were specific areas based on the way that she was contorted where the blood pooled even more and those areas were also responding to pressure now for those of you
you who think we might have changed subject because the terms were changed from lividity to liver mortis, I just want to point out that if you look up the definition of liver mortis, you will find that it also means lividity. So yes, this section right here debunks the claims made about this section right here. Do I need to go over any other stupid conspiracy theories about Adnan Saeed being innocent? What about the Brady violations? Supposedly, it's a Brady violation for the cops to not disclose that at other points they looked at other suspects and allegedly theoretically this would have helped prove Adnan is innocent because this is supposedly exculpatory evidence now this was adjudicated multiple different times this was discovered to not be a failure to disclose kind of situation and more importantly the other suspect that they looked at was not somebody who was randomly completely disconnected from Adnan it was actually Adnan's best friend at the mosque and mentor a 27 year old who only worked as another accomplice, not as a suspect on their own. So if Adnan wanted to run into court with the defense that it was his friend and mentor who did the killing without him, even though he only works as an accomplice, not as a killer, then feel free. But no, that is not a failure to disclose exculpatory evidence. What happened here is that Adnan lost every appeal. What happened here is that his buddy was making money off of pretending he was innocent and everybody was making money along the way and you kept only hearing one side perpetuated throughout the media and that side does not hold up to scrutiny. All of these details, all of these facts were brought up in a court of law. They lost each and every time on appeal because they happened to be meritless. But then Mosby, a woke district attorney who refuses to prosecute anybody, lost her primary. When she lost her primary and is actually facing fraud charges, she decided it would be a good idea while she's going out the door as a final F you to Baltimore to open up this case and basically file a motion on behalf of the defense with stuff that was contradicted on appeal multiple different times. So she did this and she set up a scenario where she would declare him innocent based on frivolous evidence and that evidence is frivolous and as predicted, she has done just that. So let's be clear, if you are under the impression that the shoes found in Heyman Lee's car, not found on her body, having the DNA profiles of four people that were not Adnan Saeed means that there's four real killers in this case, you're an idiot. You're a fool. You got suckered in. You're somebody who believes that the word DNA is a magic word. Don't read past the headline and you just go off of that and you deserve to be conned anytime, any place, because that's who you are, and you falling for this con, you buying into this, actually denied justice to the family of Heyman Lee, who once again, coincidentally, was not informed prior to this hearing, prior to this dump, prior to the charges being dropped in violation of Maryland's victim rights statute. Remember, there's an actual victim in this case. While it's all fun and games to pretend that we have a mystery on our hands and pretend to be internet sleuths, a girl was murdered by her ex-boyfriend because he could not let her go a family is shocked and destroyed by these actions and is repeatedly destroyed as you put their story on display for your entertainment this case is a travesty of justice this case is a prime example of innocence fraud and the reason we cover these cases the reason we tell the truth about these cases is once it's out there it's going to set it in the narrative once it's out there people are going to have it in the back of their minds that random shoe dna that has nothing to do with the murder that's found on the victim's car somehow exonerates the murderer and they're going to jump for joy and celebrate that again i can't wait for people to run the testing of nicole brown simpson's shoes that were in her car so that they could find the real killer in the OJ Simpson case. Can't wait to see it because apparently all you have to do is find a pair of shoes in a car, run some DNA testing, and you'll find the real killer. You don't even need somebody to be murdered if you find DNA on shoes in anybody's car, even if that person's still alive, then that means the people whose DNA is on those shoes actually killed that person. Why do we even need a body for crimes? Why do we even have trials? All we have to do is look for shoe DNA inside somebody's car and apparently that proves something. Again, can't wait for them to test all the other things that Heyman Lee touched at some point in her life so we could find even more killers. Maybe there's 50 killers. Maybe there's 100 killers in this case. We'll never know because we don't know to the extent that Heyman Lee stepped on other people's DNA going throughout the course of her day-to-day -day life. So yeah, this is injustice. This is innocence fraud. It's disgusting. And if you throw more stupid conspiracy theories in my comments, 
Don't think I'm not going to address them. Don't think I'm not going to highlight them. Don't think I'm not going to look into them, find out that they're insane, and destroy them. Adnan Saeed is guilty. Heyman Lee's family deserves justice. They were denied it. Make no mistake about it. But hey, those are just my thoughts. They happen to be 100% right and accurate. Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. If you like the video, show them by leaving a like. Subscribe for more content. Follow me on all my social media. Support me via the support links in the description box of this video. This has been me talking about the travesty, the injustice of Adnan Saeed being released. Till next time.